1966, Formula One doubled its engine limit, and the paddock chased raw power. Jack Brabham did the opposite. He chose a lighter, simpler V8, built around a proven alloy block with calm, single-cam heads, then asked it to finish Sundays. The shock is that it worked. Repco 620 didn't outmuscle Ferrari or BRM. It outlasted them, turning economy into speed and making restraint a winning strategy. Rule shock. Open door. How 3.0 liters rewrote the grid. Formula One's sudden jump from 1.5 to 3.0 liters rewired incentives. Teams that had spent years polishing miniature, high-revving engines woke to a new arithmetic. Bigger lungs, heavier hardware, uncertain suppliers. Coventry Climax stepped away from a clean-sheet 3-liter, leaving multiple constructors without a seamless path. Others pushed into complex territory, 12s with long parts lists, or multi-bank experiments that promised dino glory and delivered packaging headaches. Within that scramble, Jack Brabham recognized a quieter advantage. If rival cars arrived fast, but thirsty and fragile, a lighter package that started with less fuel, treated tires gently, and simply kept turning could convert consistency into points. That logic set the brief. Build an engine that fit the existing BT-19 space frame without demanding a wholesale redesign, prefer proven materials, and straightforward valve gear over headline lift numbers. Prioritize accessibility, so an over-the-wall fix didn't consume a weekend. The choice of a production-derived aluminium block, sourced from the Oldsmobile 215 family, was not romantic. It was pragmatic. Repco's engineers could sleeve it, stiffen it with magnesium castings, and crown it with single overhead cam cylinder heads of their own design. The result would never terrify a dynamometer, but it could be built quickly, maintained sanely, and trusted at race distance. Philosophy turned into schedule pressure. The new rule set arrived faster than wind tunnels, and drawing offices could respond. Repco's small team and Phil Irving's austere design sense cut through delay. Chain-driven cams, modest valve angles, and oiling that favored durability over heroics. The goal was a wide, usable torque band rather than a spiky summit, with combustion chambers shaped for clean burn rather than brochure figures. Because the BT-19 had been conceived for a different engine entirely, packaging discipline mattered. Ancillaries had to sit where mechanics could reach them. Mass had to live low. Cooling and fuel routing had to respect a slim nose and tight flanks. When the first 620s ran, they validated the hunch. The engine asked for less cooling air than an overvalved rival, drank less fuel per lap, and rewarded tidy driving with linear response. It wouldn't win a qualifying war on sheer thrust, but it would load the race with fewer variables, on paper that looked conservative. Over a championship, it looked like a plan. The unlikely blueprint. Brabham, Repco, and Phil Irving. Jack Brabham's pitch to Repco was disarmingly simple. Give me a compact, durable V8 my mechanics can understand. He wasn't shopping for fashion. The engine had to sit in a space frame built for a flat 16 that never materialized, keep its weight honest, and start every race without mood swings. Repco listened because the brief matched its strengths. Short decision lines, practical casting experience, and a willingness to adapt an existing block if it cut risk. Phil Irving turned that brief into drawings with a clarity that still reads modern. He resisted the temptation to chase four valves per cylinder and sky-high lifts, choosing instead a single cam per bank, operating two valves through simple followers. With chain drive, robust, light, familiar, the valve train stayed compact, keeping the heads narrow and serviceable. Repco stiffened the 215 block with alloy castings, installed iron liners, and specified a forged crank and sensible rods. Nothing in that parts list looks exotic. Everything in it speaks to predictable behavior. The first iteration landed quickly. Within months, the 620 ran, revealing the character designers hoped for, but couldn't guarantee. A broad plateau of torque beginning low enough to pull long gears cleanly, and an appetite for revs that stopped short of abuse. On the test bed, the figure sheet disappointed romantics. Power near 300, not the 360 stories drifting out of Marinello. But the total package impressed pragmatists. It idled cleanly, 
resisted heat soak, and settled after short setup changes rather than wandering. Just as important was the way the pieces could be handled at the circuit. Heads came off without elaborate rituals. The timing arrangement could be checked without removing the world. Oil pumps and water routing were accessible. Spare blocks didn't require a banker's escort. Even the choice of fixings and gasket materials reflected a worldview. Make the failure modes slow and visible, not sudden and catastrophic. That's how bulletproof begins, not with a myth of indestructibility, but with an honest machine that tells you what it needs and gives you time to answer. Architecture that works, dimensions, breathing, and the quiet advantages. Numbers first, then the meaning behind them. The 620 sits at 2,995 cubic centimeters, with a 90-degree bank angle and an oversquare layout. It carries a single overhead camshaft per bank, driving two valves per cylinder, with chain drive keeping the tower compact. Combustion chambers are shaped for clean flame travel at sensible compression, allowing modest spark advance on the fuels of the day. The crank is a forged piece with conservative bearing loads. Auxiliaries are arranged to avoid parasitic penalties while keeping the engine short in plan and low in installed height. From those choices come behaviors that matter during a race. The heads are light, so the engine's center of gravity sits where the chassis likes it. The valve gear's inertia is modest, keeping spring loads reasonable and friction in check. Oil circuits prioritize scavenge reliability so the engine spends less time aerating its sump during long, loaded corners. With fewer rotating masses stacked high, the package warms quickly and stays thermally calm. The car can be fueled leaner at the start without flirting with detonation, and the cooling system can run smaller surfaces. Packaging discipline pays a second dividend. Service. A mechanic can reach the hardware that actually wears and do it without dismantling an ecosystem. That isn't a romantic virtue, it's the difference between a preventative adjustment on Saturday and an emergency rebuild on Sunday morning. The lighter block and hids also change race arithmetic. Starting a Grand Prix with a smaller fuel load is not only a mass advantage, it trims brake temperatures, tire wear, and the rate at which a space frame ages under stress. Transmission choices tell the same story. Early in the season, a Hewland HD gearbox tolerated the 620's torque but disliked brutal launches. Brabham managed starts with mechanical sympathy until a tougher DG unit arrived. The point isn't that components never failed, but that the car telegraphed what it needed. When the powertrain asked for gentler clutch work, the driver obliged. When the team received a stronger casing, they fitted it and moved on. The philosophy remained intact. Minimize variables, make the speed repeatable. Beating power, with package, why the numbers on paper lied. On the bench, Ferrari's 3-liter V12 and BRM's multi-bank projects made larger peaks. On circuits that punished brakes, tires, and fuel, those peaks often came with a bill. The Repco 620's advantage was hidden in the margins. Less fuel mass at the start, lower cooling drag, calmer brake temperatures, and a chassis that stayed within its window as the rubber aged. In an era before refueling choreography, Starting with 20 liters fewer was time in the bank. Fuel economy also widened strategic options. If the car could run a full distance at a consistent mixture without nursing, the driver's brain cycles were free for traffic and preservation rather than crisis management. Tires lived longer because the engine's torque arrived evenly. Brakes survived because the car weighed less each lap. Gearboxes lasted because torque spikes were modest. A race weekend without late-night rebuilds frees mechanics to check the small things that actually end races, clips, lines, and fasteners. That loop is invisible from a single horsepower number and decisive over a season. Complexity wasn't a moral failing. Many brilliant engines were a thicket of parts, but it was a tax. Every extra cam, follower, or pump broadened the range of ways a Saturday could go wrong. The 620 narrowed that range. It wasn't indestructible. It was predictable. Predictability is what lets a team risk pushing a stint or an overcut, knowing the power unit will be there on lap 70 as it was on lap 7. It's what lets a driver break deep in dirty air without wondering whether a surge of heat will push the cooling system past its limit. Cost and logistics reinforced the theme. 
Blocks were obtainable, liners replaceable, and consumables sane. Because the hardware was comprehensible, the squad could train more hands to the same level, shortening the mean time to repair. A privateer's nightmare is an elegant part that only one specialist can adjust. A champion's friend is a design that any trained mechanic can service. In 1966, Brabham had the latter. A race weekend without late-night rebuilds frees mechanics to check the small things that actually end races. Clips, lines, and fasteners. 1966. Built on finishes. The season that proved the point. The campaign began without fireworks. Monaco punished everyone. Spa drenched the grid. Retirements clipped confidence across the field. What mattered was that the Brabham Repco recovered quickly from early stumbles and began converting Sundays into arithmetic. At Rams, a high-speed slipstream track, the car lacked the sovereign punch of a full song 12 on the longest straights, so Brabham tucked into the wake of faster rivals to let air do its share of the work. When the leading Ferrari faltered, he was in position, a statement less about luck than about a car that still had brakes, still had cooling, and still obeyed. Brand's hatch turned the spotlight onto drivability. On a narrow ribbon glazed with oil and mist, lap time belonged to a chassis that did not surprise its driver, and an engine that accepted partial throttle without coughing. Brabham sat on pole and controlled the pace, the car's gentle weight transfer protecting tires and keeping temperatures steady. Zondvoort added another kind of test, a surface that punished impetuous throttle and a breeze that unsettled arrow. Again, the package's even torque and sensible gearing helped the car stay inside itself, while others, caught out by conditions, faded. The Nürburgring, long and vicious, rewarded rhythm and punished overreach. There, the car's virtue was not maximum speed, but repeatability across a lap, with 100 chances to make a small mistake. Brabham took the lead early and managed it, measuring risks with the calculation of a driver constructor who knew what each component could accept. By the time Monza arrived, the title mathematics favored prudence. A mechanical setback there did not undo the season's essential shape. Four wins, robust finishes elsewhere, and a margin built on the habit of finishing. The personal milestone amplified the technical one. Jack Brabham became the first driver to win a world championship race, and then the title, in a car bearing his name. That achievement was not only about talent or bravado, it rested on the choice to back an engine whose strengths aligned with the realities of a Grand Prix distance. By year's end, the paddock understood. Conservative on paper can be ruthless on Sunday. The workshop loop, small fixes, large consequences. Reliability didn't arrive by accident, it arrived by a thousand deliberate choices. When a cylinder liner issue surfaced early, the team shifted to sleeves that would tolerate distortion and heat cycling better across a full distance. When cold oil produced unhappy noises on a winter test, gear materials and clearances were reconsidered before the next shipment left the foundry. None of those adjustments made headlines, but each clipped the tail of a failure curve. Repco's culture made that loop fast. With a compact team and straightforward castings, Feedback traveled from garage to drawing board in days rather than quarters. Because the architecture avoided exotic metallurgy and complex trains of parts, iterations stayed affordable for a customer-sized outfit. Blocks and heads moved through the system like the components they were, not like museum pieces. The team could stock spares without strangling its budget and, critically, could train new mechanics to the same standard without sending them to a monastery of secrets. Race execution benefited. Fewer overnight heart transplants meant time for the small inspections, breather lines, fasteners, heat shields that prevent DNFs nobody sees on TV. A power unit that started cleanly on Sunday mornings spared the clutch and gearbox the indignity of repeated heat cycles. Where a more stressed engine might have demanded rich mixtures to survive the first laps behind traffic, the 620 could begin near its planned settings. Tire choice and pressure schemes could be tuned for stint length rather than catastrophe avoidance. Even the supply chain mirrored the philosophy. The base blocks didn't cost a fortune. Liners, bearings, and gaskets could be stocked deep. What bespoke parts existed were sized and shaped for sane machining. The aim was never to make an unbreakable engine. It was to make one that failed slowly 
and signaled early, buying a team time to respond. In a championship measured over months, that is what bulletproof really means. Evolution, then Eclipse. RAB 740, Hume, and the DFV Horizon. The creed didn't change in 1967, but the hardware evolved. Repco introduced a new block and revised heads that moved the exhaust inward, refining the layout and nudging power upward without abandoning the engine's even temperament. With that evolution under the bodywork of the BT-20 and newer BT-24, the team defended its constructor's crown while Denny Hume assembled a champion season from relentless competence. The lap charts read like a signature. The cars started, ran within their band, and finished. At the same time, a different future rolled onto the grid. Ford's Cosworth DFV, debuting as a stressed member with serious peak output, shifted what a three-liter engine could be. Integration, engine as structure, unlocked chassis, gains a space frame Repco couldn't match, and the DFV's breathing potential reset the ceiling. No honest reading of the era pretends otherwise. By 1968, to stay in the game meant chasing higher valve area, more aggressive timing, and rev ceilings that demanded materials and budgets beyond the original 620 philosophy. Repco tried. A four-valve, higher rev follow-on arrived carrying the weight of expectation and new failure modes. Its appetite for attention strained a lean operation. The elegance of the early package, the way it turned modest parts into relentless points, was hard to preserve once the brief changed from endure to overwhelm. That isn't a failure of intelligence, it's a lesson in trade-offs. The 620 was conceived to win by finishing, and it did. When the sport moved the goalposts toward integrated structures and higher specific outputs, the smart move was to change tools. Seen from that angle, the Repco era ends without tragedy. It closes as a completed argument, in one regulatory window, with one set of constraints, a straightforward V8, and a disciplined team could beat more glamorous cousins. The record, back-to-back -back constructors' titles and consecutive drivers' crowns for two men, is the punctuation mark, the calm that wins. Without the romantic gloss, the point is simple. The Repco 620 turned a simple plan into silverware, Choose an engine that fits the frame. Choose valve gear. Your mechanics can service blindfolded. Choose an oil system that forgives, and accept that a smaller number on a dyno can grow into a larger number on a points table. The car didn't frighten rivals by the meter. It eroded them by the hour. That is why this story still matters. Motorsport loves breakthroughs that roar, but championships often belong to patience, disguised as engineering. In 1966 and the year that followed, the Brabham-Repco partnership treated design as risk management. Narrow the paths to failure, make the remaining ones slow, and let the driver spend his courage where it buys time rather than drama. When the sport changed shape, when integrated structures and higher specific outputs became the tax of participation, the same clarity dictated a different answer. The argument didn't collapse. It concluded. Call the 620 bulletproof if you want shorthand. What the word hides is more useful. The discipline to prefer repeatable procedures over fashionable ones, the humility to let finishing define fast, and the craft to distill a thousand small decisions into a car that felt inevitable when the flag fell. If you ever need a blueprint for turning limited means into maximum outcomes, start where this engine started. Design for the distance. Put the mass where the tires will thank you. Build the head you can live with for months. Then ask the stopwatch for its verdict and be ready when it agrees.